أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي My dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام Alhamdulillah, I, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me the tawfiq, the privilege and the honor of reflecting over some of the verses of the Holy Qur'an this evening with you. As you remember, brothers and sisters, we left off at verse number 39 from Surah Al-An'am. Inshallah, I'll do my best to cover uh, as many verses I, as I can in this session with you. So I'd like to turn your attention to ayah number 39. From Surah Al-An'am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا صُمٌ وَبُكْمٌ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ مَنْ يَشَئِ اللَّهُ يُضْلِلْهُ وَمَنْ يَشَئِ يَجْعَلْهُ عَلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٌ The translation reads, Those who deny our signs are deaf and dumb. In darkness, whomsoever God will, he leads astray, and whomsoever he will, he places him upon a straight path. Now when you look at this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again, he's addressing primarily the disbelievers of Mecca. And he says, وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا The verb, كَذَّبُوا refers to a type of rejection that happens over and over and over. So it's not that we're dealing with people who refuse to listen to the invitation of the Prophet once or twice. Kedhabu follows the pattern of fa'ala. You see, in Arabic, we have the word baraba, for example, which means to hit. And then you have Darraba, which means excessive hitting. So here, Kedhabu means that there is an excessive, a continuous rejection of what? Biayatina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he refers to his signs, he uses the, the plural. He doesn't say, and those who continuously reject my signs. He doesn't say, وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِ He says, بِآيَاتِنَا Because there is a dimension of, there is a majestic dimension to the divine signs. That they are rejecting something that is profound. They are reje rejecting something that is so clear and majestic and moving and profound. And as a result of this denial of truth, as a result of this stubbornness and this rebelliousness, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them as being summun wa bukmun fi dhulumat. Here, there are three human faculties that are mentioned. Summun, just so we can kind of understand the meaning of these terms, summun means to be deaf, to lose the ability to hear. Bukmun refers to the, the inability to speak. You've lost your ability to speak, a speech impediment. Fidhulumat means you are in a state of darkness, many layers of darkness. So when you look at this ayah, those who reject the truth, they are those who have lost the faculty of hearing. They have lost the faculty of speech, and because they are in darkness, they have lost the faculty of sight. So hearing, the ear, the eye, and the tongue are the three main faculties through which we understand the world around us. These are the three instruments through which 
we are able as human beings to realize truth. So these individuals, because of their rebellious attitude and their consistent rejection of truth, they have become deaf, dumb, and blind. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He describes these disbelievers, He says that the reason why that they're not able to ascertain the truth, they're not able to arrive at these philosophical truths is because of this deafness, this dumbness, and this blindness. Now, conversely, those who are able to appreciate and experience the truth in a deep way are those who are the best listeners, those who use their tongue, who ask questions, and those who have this spiritual insight. You find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of all of the faculties, He mentions deafness to be the first impediment to the realization of truth. And you find that being an attentive listener is one of the most important practices to adopt if we want to attain spiritual refinement. There's a hadith from Amir al Mu'mineen, salawatullahi alayhi where he says, إِذَا لَمْ تَكُنْ عَالِمًا نَاطِقًا فَكُنْ مُسْتَمِعًا وَاعِيًا The Imam السلام, he says that if you are not an articulate scholar, then at the very least be an attentive listener. There are many, many of the individuals in Mecca, the reason why they did not submit to the truth is because they weren't even willing to listen. So having this humility to at least listen in an unbiased way, in an objective way, is the first step to spiritual development, being an attentive listener. The reason why so many of the Meccans rejected the truth is because they weren't even willing to lend their ears to the Holy Prophet. So you find that the kuffar are described as those who are spiritually deaf. And we said conversely, though the human beings that are the most enlightened are who? Are those who are the best listeners. And this is why in the Quran, in Surah at tawbah Surah number 9, verse 61, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is described as being the best listener. So if those who reject the truth are spiritually deaf, the first ones to submit to the truth are going to be who? Those who have keen and sharp spiritual ears. They have this attentive listening. So if you look at ayah number 61 of Surah Tatawbah, there were a group of individuals from among the Muslims, some of the Sahaba, who were probably accustomed to an authoritarian style of governance. So they, they used to become very frustrated with the Holy Prophet's leadership style because Rasulullah was very consultative with his community. So the Quran says, Allah says there are some among them who wish to hurt the Prophet, who wish to insult the Prophet. How did they used to insult Rasulullah? They would say, they would mock and ridicule the Prophet and make fun of him and say that he is an ear. They would call Rasulullah Udhun because he used to listen, because he used to be consultative. So one of the most dangerous spiritual diseases is to, is to be stubborn and not listen, to not have the humility to seriously consider information that is presented to you. So some of the Mufassireen, they say rejection of the truth results in, causes spiritual deafness. Others say no, it's the spiritual deafness itself that makes them reject the truth. So the first thing that's mentioned in this ayah is that those who continuously reject the truth, they are deaf. They have this spiritual deafness. 
Because they are spiritually deaf, you know, you notice that even those who are physically deaf, they're not able to what? They're not able to develop their language skills. So people who are deaf oftentimes are not able to speak. Also, in the spiritual world, someone who's not a good listener is most likely not going to be someone who's going to ask very deep questions. And we can even apply this even to, you know, our interactions today. You know, if, you're, if you've ever taught a class, you know, those who are the best listeners usually are the ones who ask the best questions. They go hand in hand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those who do not listen, who have the spiritual deafness are also dumb. Meaning they're not able to use their tongue to allow them to grow spiritually. How do we use our tongue to, to facilitate spiritual development? By asking questions. When you're an attentive listener, you're automatically going to be an individual who's going to ask good questions, insightful questions. And therefore we have many ahadith about the virtue of asking questions. There is a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi where he says, when someone asks a question, there are four groups who are rewarded. Imagine, someone asks a question and there are four recipients of reward. The hadith says the one who is asking, because the one who is asking is trying to increase their knowledge. The one who is answering the question, because they are sharing knowledge. So the seeker of knowledge is rewarded and the one who is answering, the one who is imparting knowledge is rewarded. How about the other two? The third is the one who is listening to the dialogue, you know, the spectator. And the fourth is the one who loves the three, the one who loves this exercise of, of, uh, of increasing and seeking knowledge also receives the reward. So the asker, the answerer, the spectator, and the lover of the three. In fact, there are many ahadith that have reached us because of the barakah of asking questions. Dua Kumail, which we recite on Thursday nights. Dua Kumail came to us because Kumail ibn Ziyad took the initiative and asked Amir al-Mu'mineen a question. When Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi alayhi was the Khalifa, he used to travel throughout the Islamic empire. On one occasion, he visited the city of Basra. Basra, there was a masjid there. The Imam alayhi salam delivered a sermon in Masjid al-Basra. And the Imam alayhi salam in this sermon, he made a reference to the dua of Khidr. Khidr is mentioned in the Quran as being the mentor of Musa alayhi salam. So the Imam alayhi salam, you know, very casually, mentions the dua of Khidr. After the Imam gave his sermon, no one asked the Imam, O oh, Imam, what is the dua of Khidr? Except for Kumail ibn Ziyad. Kumail, late at night, he comes and he knocks on the door of Amir al-Mu'mineen and he asks the Imam, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, in your khutbah, you mentioned dua of Khidr. Can you teach me the dua of Khidr? The Imam alayhi salam, he sat him down, he went outside with him, and he said to him that, O oh Kumail, I want you to memorize this dua, I want you to record it, and I want you to recite it at least one time in your life. If you're not able to recite it one time in your life, then at least once a year. If you're not able to do it once a year, once a month, if you're not able to do once a month, at least do recite it once a week. So the Imam alayhi salam, he teaches him this dua, which becomes known as dua kumail. Why did dua kumail, why did we come across dua kumail? Why was it given, it given to us? Because kumail ibn Ziyad asked a question. Because he was an attentive listener, he listened attentively to the khutbah of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and the Imam alayhi salam shared this dua with him. So the ayah says, وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا صُمٌّ 
وَبُكْمٌ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ They're in darkness. This spiritual deafness, this inability to even use their tongue to bring them closer to the truth. Because they're in darkness, they're also not able to see. You know, brothers and sisters, there are some individuals who are able to draw lessons from seemingly mundane things. There are individuals who are able to look up at the sky. They're, look, they, they're able to look at the sun, the moon, vegetation, trees, rivers, animals, and they're able to draw lessons from everything that they see because the eye of their heart is not blind. They have this spiritual insight. وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا صُمٌّ وَبُكْمٌ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ مَنْ يَشَأِ اللَّهُ يُضْلِلْهُ وَمَنْ يَشَأْ يَجْعَلْهُ عَلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Whomsoever God wills, He leads astray. And whomsoever He will, He places him upon a straight path. There are many verses in the Qur'an that ascribe misguidance to Allah and guidance to Allah. And these verses have led to serious theological questions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's role in human moral choice, in the destiny of man. And it's raised a lot of discussion about the meaning of Allah's irada, of Allah's will. You know, brothers and sisters, we have five schools of jurisprudence. You know, we have the Ja'fari school of fiqh, we have the Hanafi, the Hanbali, the Shafi'i, and the Maliki. These are jurisprudential schools. These are schools of fiqh. In the Sunni world, there are two main schools of theology. There are two main theological schools, the Mu'tazilis, and the Ash'aris. We don't have time to go into detail about how these, these, uh, these, the, these theological schools came to form. But very briefly, the Mu'tazilis, they're similar to the Shi'as in, the, in, in that when they come across verses that ascribe misguidance to Allah, where Allah says, يُضْلِلُهُ that Allah leads them astray, they say, they argue that this misguidance is not direct. So they say, so the Mu'tazilis argue that Yudhlilhu is not an act of direct misguidance, but rather a withholding of divine favor. There is a withholding of this divine lutf that we call. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not cause them to go astray. Rather, He withholds guidance from them because they're not seeking it. The Ash'aris... Unfortunately, the majority of the Sunni world are Ash'aris theologically. They hold that guidance or misguidance is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. And Allah, just as He created man, He created the actions of man. So if a person is misguided, it's because Allah willed for them to be misguided. If Allah guides someone, it's an arbitrary process. Allah guides whoever He wishes and He misguides. He who he wishes. You find that many of you may be familiar with, with Bahlul. Bahlul was one of the students of Imam al kazim and Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhima. Bahlul was a contemporary of Abu Hanifa. And Abu Hanifa believed that human actions were controlled by God. So if Abu Hanifa were to read this ayah, he would use this as a dalil, as a proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides and he chooses and he misguides. So if we see someone go astray, it's because Allah willed for him to go astray. And if we see someone on the straight path, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala arbitrarily decided to place them on the straight path. So one day the tradition say that Bahlul attended one of the classes of Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa was teaching, there were many students who were in attendance, and Bahlul took a stone in the middle of the class and he launched it at Abu Hanifa's face, and the rock struck him on his head. Now you can imagine students, there's a class being there's a class in session, and Bahlul throws a rock 
and Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa, of course, there's a lot of commotion. He decides to take Bahlul to court. Bahlul, he used to act insane. He was actually a very wise man, but through his insanity, he would teach very important lessons to the community. In any case, they go to court, and Bahlul and Abu Hanifa are standing in front of the judge. The judge asks Abu Hanifa that, what is, why are you in court? What is the case? Abu Hanifa says that I was conducting my class. Bahlul entered into the classroom, and as I was lecturing, he took a rock, he took a stone, and he threw it at me. The judge turns to Bahlul and says, is this true? Did you essentially assault him while he was conducting his class? Bahlul says, before I answer the question, I'd like to address three important points, three beliefs that that Abu Hanifa teaches. He says the first is Abu Hanifa is of the belief that shaitan will not suffer in the hellfire because shaitan is created from fire and fire cannot incur pain on fire. And he says, but I would like to disprove that today and by saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Abu Hanifa from clay and I took a piece of clay and I threw it at him and lo and behold clay inflicted pain upon clay and then he says secondly Abu Hanifa is of the belief he's of the opinion that everything that exists can be seen and that's why he believes that on the day of judgment Allah can be seen so I ask him that he's claiming to be in pain I want him to show me his pain Abu Hanifa was silent. Then thirdly, he says, Abu Hanifa is of the belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates human action, that everything that takes place is under divine control, that human beings essentially do not possess free will. So I would like to exonerate myself today by saying that it was not me who threw the rock at Abu Hanifa, rather it was God himself who threw the rock towards Abu Hanifa. So you find that these verses used to raise a lot of theological discussion among the Muslims. Some Muslims would use this verse to prove that human beings do not possess free will. Others would argue that no, this, this verse in no way negates the notion of, of, uh, of free will. If you look at Surah Al-Ankabut, Surah number 29, verse 69, the Mu'tazis and also the Ulama of Ahlul Bayt they argue that Allah is the guide. He is the one who guides and he is the one who misguides. But there is a system to this guidance and misguidance. Allah says, Those who struggle in our path, in our way, we guide them to our paths. So if someone puts effort, if someone has a desire to know the truth, the Hidayah comes. Divine guidance descends. But if someone doesn't make an effort, if someone is lazy, if someone is not interested in finding the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withholds guidance. And consequently, that, that individual is led astray. So the ulama of Ahlul Bayt, they, they share the same view as the Mu'tazilis in this regard. And it's interesting that when Allah speaks about guiding, what does He say? وَمَنْ يَشَأْ يَجْعَلْهُ عَلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ If Allah wills, He places that person on the straight path. It's not that Allah guides them towards the straight path. He actually places the person on the straight path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an active role in our guidance. He doesn't only show us the way, he takes us to that path of guidance if we submit to him and if we surrender to him. And it's interesting that when Allah speaks about being guided, he always speaks about a straight path. We know that the shortest distance between two points is what? A straight line. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially is telling us that if you submit to me, not only will I guide you, but I will accelerate your path to me. 
So if you surrender to me, not only will I take you to the destination, which is me, which is your Lord, but I will put you on the straight path, which means the shortest distance between two points. I will put you on an accelerated path towards me. The next ayah, ayah number 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتَكُمْ إِنْ أَتَاكُمْ عَذَابُ اللَّهِ أَوْ أَتَتْكُمُ السَّاعَةُ أَغَيْرَ اللَّهِ تَدْعُونَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Say, the ayah is instructing the Prophet to say to these Meccans, think to yourselves, were the punishment of God to come upon you, or were the hour to come upon you, would you call upon anyone other than God if you are truthful? And then I'll, I'll read the next ayah and inshallah I'll explain. بَلْ إِيَّاهُ تَدْعُونَ فَيَكْشِفُ مَا تَدْعُونَ إِلَيْهِ إِنْ شَاءُ وَتَنْسَوْنَ مَا تُشْرِكُونَ The ayah says, nay, but it, it is upon him that you would call. And he would remove that which had caused you to call upon him, if it be his will. And you would forget whatever partners you had ascribed to them, ascribed to him. Now, here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is making an argument for number one, his existence, and number truth, number two, he's making an argument for his oneness. So this ayah, there's an istidlal, an argument made for his Allah's existence and for his oneness. Now, keep in mind that the primary audience of this verse is who? The Meccans, the pagans, the, uh, the, the idol worshippers of Mecca, who actually believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. You know, there's a common misconception that the Meccans were atheists. The Meccans were not atheists. If you look at Surah Az zumar verse 38, and even in Surah Luqman, there are many verses to the same effect. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ If you ask them, O Muhammad, مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Who created the heavens and the earth? لَيَقُولُنَّ Allah. They would surely say Allah. So they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. But they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't engage with his creation, that he's not personable, that Allah creates and he steps back. He's not involved in the affairs of his creation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially saying that when, when my adab descends, here adabullah might refer to the coming of catastrophic worldly destruction or any type of natural disaster we may we may encounter, or a sa'a. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that there are two occasions in the life of the human being where human beings universally turn to a higher power. When there is a natural disaster, where there is an existential crisis, or when the hour comes. Some ulama say that this hour refers to the moment of death. When you feel, when there's a natural disaster, when there's a disaster, when a disaster befalls you, when there's destruction, when there's an existential crisis, when your life is in danger, when death comes to you, you all turn to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you all turn to me with the utmost sincerity. So Allah is asking a rhetorical question. Who do you turn to when my punishment descends and when the hour, when the hour of death approaches? It's a rhetorical question and Allah answers the question in ayah number 41. He is the only one that you call upon. And he, he basically... He causes, he answers your prayers. He removes that which had caused you to call upon him, if he wills. And in that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, 
وَتَنْسَوْنَ مَا تُشْرِكُونَ At that moment, that moment of grave peril, that moment of hopeless, hopelessness and despair, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all people are sincere in their dua to me. Even the mushrik forgets the partners that he has ascribed. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's telling us that it's in your fitrah that when you experience an existential crisis, when you are experiencing deep despair, Allah says there is no more shirk in you at that moment. You forget everything that you have ascribed. So in ayah number 41, God's saving, God saving them offers hope that they will forget whatever partners they had ascribed upon him and abandon, abandon the false deities that they had worshipped alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, you temporarily forget what you have ascribed to me in those moments of despair. So you find brothers and sisters, you know, it's interesting. I think maybe I've shared this with you. I remember, you know, Chris, Christopher Hitchens, when he was being interviewed, Christopher Hitchens passed away several years ago, and he was a staunch atheist. He actually wrote many books to disprove the existence of God. He actually wrote a bestseller called God is Not Great, and he makes a case for atheism and how atheism is basically a sign of human progression and so on and so forth. So he, and he used to go around the world and, and lecture and to essentially disprove the existence of God. And subhanAllah, the same tongue, the same throat that he used to use to challenge the existence of God, he actually ended up developing throat cancer. So in his final interview, when he was being interviewed, the, uh, the interviewer asked, asked him, that you've spent your entire life, you made a career out of atheism. Now that you have cancer, now that you're terminally ill and your days are numbered, do you have any doubt? Do you pray? Do you feel that there is a higher power that could rescue you? He says, and subhanAllah, look at this stubbornness. So Allah in this ayah, He's speaking about, you know, what happens deep in the heart. You know, someone may reject this, but every person when they're alone, when there are no cameras, the dua is happening, whether it's verbal or it's internal. However, Christopher Hitchens, his response was what? When this man asked him that when you're in your final moments, do you think you might revert back to God? His response was, I want there to be a camera and I want them to record me in my last moments as proof that I died rejecting God. He says that I don't want any rumors to circulate that I, Christopher Hitchens, turned to God in my, hour, in my last moments. You find that, subhanAllah, there are some individuals that are so arrogant so stubborn but here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they can deny all they want in their minds in their hearts they're reaching out to me because this is part of the nature this is part of the fitrah of the human being and then in ayah number 42 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمَمٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ we have indeed sent messengers onto communities before you, and we have seized them with misfortune and hardship that they might humble themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah is mentioning a sunnah, a type of divine law that we see with every community that he sends prophets to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and this is more clearly mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, Surah number 7, verse 94, and notice that Allah mentions Ba'sa and Dharra. Now, if you look at the translation, 
Ba'sa is translated as misfortune, whereas Barra is translated as hardship. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in many verses, He mentions Ba'sa and Barra together. For example, if you go to Surah Al Baqarah, Surah 2, verse 177, Allah mentions that the patient ones are those who are patient when وَالصَّابِرِينَ فِي الْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ Those who are patient in times of misfortune and hardship. Now, what is the difference between بَأْسَاء and ضَرَّاء? Some of the commentators of the Qur'an, they say بَأْسَاء refers to loss of wealth. Loss of wealth. And ضَرَّاء refers to illness or physical suffering so so ba'sa is loss of wealth loss of resources whereas the ra is loss of health physical suffering psychological suffering so the ayah says and i point your attention to surat al-araf verse 94 because if we if we put these verses together we can understand what is the meaning of Ba'sa and Barra and how it how and how it plays in our spiritual development? Allah says, Wama arsalna fi karyatim min nabiyin illa akhadna ahlaha bil ba'sa wa barra la allahum yadbarraun. Allah says, I have never sent a messenger to a community unless I made that community, unless I seized that community with Ba'sa and Dharra. Why? Why does Allah make human beings go through loss of wealth and loss of health, physical suffering? Allah says what? So you can be humble. If you look at the, the Muslim community during the time of the Holy Prophet, you see, they went through what? Ba'sa and Dharra. They experienced a loss of wealth. Many of you, can, can any of you think of a time in the Muslim community where there was a loss of wealth? The Shi'ab of Abu Talib, Shi'ab of Abi Talib, where the Muslims were economically sanctioned. They had barely anything. Every single religious community has experienced times of poverty. Times where they lost wealth, they had limited resources. And Barat was also there. The companions, the Muslim community, they were physically assaulted. They went through psychological trauma, psychological pain, physical pain. They had to leave behind their homes. They had to be separated from their spouses and their children. They had to fight in the battlefields and endure physical pain. So whether it's the community of Rasulullah, the community of Musa, of Isa, of Nuh, every community experienced Ba'sa and Dharra for one purpose, so they can achieve. Allah says, so perhaps you can be humble. Now, it's interesting that if it weren't for loss of wealth and loss of health, most human beings would be arrogant. In fact, there's a hadith that I'd like to share with you. From The hadith is from the Holy Prophet ﷺ, where he says, The Holy Prophet, he says, if it were not for three things, the son of Adam, meaning the human being, would never lower his head in humility. Al Marab wal Faq wal Maut. If it were not for these three things, no human being would bow their heads in humility. If it were not for sickness, if it were not for poverty, and it were, and if it were not for death. No human being would bow their heads in humility. And then, they, then the Holy Prophet says, 
وَإِنَّهُ لَمَعَهُنَّ لَوَثَّابُ The Holy Prophet says, the human being does endure sickness, poverty, and death, and there are many human beings that are still arrogant. Imagine. There is sickness, there is poverty, and there is death, and you have people like Fir'aun who say, أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى If there was no sickness, if there was no poverty, and there was no death, every person, you and I, would say, أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى We would feel invincible. We would develop the sense of divinity. We would feel indestructible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I make you experience misfortune and hardship so you can be humble. Why? Because the only way you can submit to the truth is if you have a heart that is humbled. There's a hadith from Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim salawatullahi alayhi where he says, إِنَّ الزَّرْعَ يَنْبُتُ فِي السَّهْلِ وَلَا يَنْبُتُ فِي الصَّفَى Imam al-Kadhim, he gives an analogy. He says, vegetation grows on soft land, on fertile land. It doesn't grow on rough and hard terrain. فَكَذَلِكَ الْحِكْمَةِ Similarly, wisdom does not flourish. فَكَذَلِكَ الْحِكْمَةِ تَعْمُرُ فِي قَلْبِ الْمُتَوَاضِعِ Wisdom grows in the heart of the one who is humble. وَلَا تَعْمُرُ فِي قَلْبِ الْمُتَكَبِّرِ الْجَبَّارِ Wisdom does not grow in the heart of someone who is arrogant. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, he says every community, every prophet that I sent, I made them and their communities go through misfortune and hardships in hopes that they will be humble. Because when they have humble hearts, they are primed and they are prepared to submit to the truth. And interestingly, that when you look at the Quran, there are certain chapters in the Quran that begin with, الحروف المقطعات The disjointed letters, the disconnected letters. ألف لام ميم, ألف لام را, كاف هاء يا عين صاد. Some of the commentators of the Quran, they maintain that these mystical letters are unknown to us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended for us to, intended for us not to know the meaning. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to learn that we don't know everything. We have to first admit our ignorance before we can benefit from this book. So when you open, when you read Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, Alif Lam Meem, the first ayah, you don't understand it. And it's intended for you not to understand it. It's intended for you to admit that you don't know, to admit your ignorance. Because when you approach the Qur'an with that, with that mindset, with that intellectual humility, only then will you benefit from the teachings and the instructions of the Holy Qur'an. Inshallah, we'll leave, we'll leave off here and we'll continue our discussion, inshallah. Next week, I apologize. My, uh, I'm a bit congested today, so I'm not able to really speak for a very long period of time. But we have a little bit of time for... For Q and A, inshallah, if we have any questions, I'll take them now. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I have a few questions. I want to start with the last um, last topic you covered today. No. You mentioned that um, the human beings have to go through uh, misfortune to become humble, to go through difficulties to become humble. Um, so is, is, it, uh, is it correct to say that the only way to, to, develop, um, to develop ourselves is to go through a hardship? And if that's the case, um, you know, if I compare our lives to other human beings, around the world like you know people in Africa a lot of people that are going through hardship it's hard to say that 
we have any hardship and you know the way we are living here yeah so what now what does that mean for us if you are if you are having such a good life um can we say we have hardship and what does uh, how can we develop ourselves if you're not really going through any hardship now again when, when we speak about now you and i might not have physical hardship you know we might not be experiencing hunger we might not have to worry about putting a roof over our heads like other people around the world but we also have our own set of hardships you know for example dispelling the misconceptions that people have about islam you know you know being discriminated against so there is there is a type of psychological hardship that uh, that we endure so i wouldn't say that you know i would say that we both are experiencing hardship but it's a different type of hardship in fact allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the holy quran if you go to surat al-a'raf surah 7 168 allah says allah uses the word bala Allah says, I have tried you. I have tried them with hasanat, with the things that are good, with ease, with ni'mah. And I have also tried them with difficulties. Both of them, Allah calls it bala. So don't think that bala only refers to, to the person who is hungry. Bala trial is also for the person who is in a state of ease. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects shukr from the one who is who is receiving blessings and he expects sabr from the one who is experiencing hardship. And sometimes it's just as difficult to be grateful and to be mindful of Allah's blessings when you're when you're in a state of ease as it is for someone to be patient during times of trial and tribulation that's why you find there are more people who there are more religious people who are poor than affluent people who are religious so sometimes the greater bala is actually affluence and ease because people they they become more disconnected they become deluded because they're not experiencing any hardship they're very forgetful they take allah's blessings for granted so it's interesting that allah uses the word bala when he speaks about both times of ease and times of difficulty but to go back to your question i would say that there are different types of hardships there are different types of hardships i have a question about the letters the letters that you mentioned at the end um, like Al Islam mean. No. Are they are they always at the so they always appear at the beginning of the surah? Was it always like this? Did the prophets preface a surah with these letters, or would he say them in the middle in the way we organize the Quran later? We put them at the beginning. Is that something? So, if I understood your question correctly, there are uh, there are a few surahs in the Quran that begin with those disconnected letters and those those verses are in, in the right place they're in the beginning of the surah the disjointed letters are not found in the middle of a, of a surah so it's always at the beginning of recitation it's always at the beginning yes yeah so my question was would, would the rasul say them in the beginning and then continue with the other ayahs or yeah so for example with, with surah al-baqarah Rasulullah would say, Alif Lam Meem, Thalik Al Kitabu La Raibafi. He would definitely not emit it. He would recite it at the beginning. Am I understanding the question correctly? Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, just one another question on the same topic of uh, hardship. I mentioned that like uh, that every religious community that when the before the a prophet is sent to them they are facing times of hardship uh at least from my perspective it seems like some of the times like that hasn't been the case or at least that's not mentioned in the story where like when prophet uh lose people they don't seem to have faced any hardship until the final punishment came to them 
No, the, the, the ayah, if you go to the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't necessarily say that the, 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 the misfortune and the hardship was before or after. At any given time, this, uh, the community is going to endure misfortune and hardship. So it's not that it's going to happen before, during, after. So with the community of, uh, your, your question was about the community of Lut. Yeah, or, or any other communities where it didn't seem like they had necessarily faced hardship. The community of Lut. Yeah, off the top of my mind, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately, ultimately destroyed them and punished them. But I would imagine that if they were to have joined and submitted to Lut, naturally they would face adversity. So a natural consequence of submitting to the truth is that you're going to attract adversity and that adversity is going to bring about misfortune and hardship. Um, I have another question, Molana. Sure. Um, so one of the things that you also mentioned today is, uh, in uh, as an example, Surah al Kabut, uh, you mentioned that uh, um, if you seek uh, guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to you. And if you don't seek guidance, uh, he will uh, withhold it from you. Yeah. Um, is, it, uh, is that correct to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, help you in in whatever way you choose to go if it's a positive way if it's a right direction he will help you and if it's a wrong direction he either it help you or withhold you from not withhold you from not going that path is that is that fair to say you know i would say that 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 is an accurate way of looking at it so if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate whatever direction you choose so if you choose to move towards him, he'll facilitate that. If you choose to move away from him, he'll facilitate that in that he, he'll, he's not going to strip you of your free will and draw you back to him. And, um, and uh, the other question uh, with that was, um, what does it actually mean to, to say that I seek guidance? Um, so what does that what does that mean? If I seek guidance, does that mean I have to show my actions, um, or is that just asking for help? Seeking guidance can be expressed in many ways. You know, seeking guidance could be something as as simple as du'a, asking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to guide you, asking questions, reading, you know, pondering. You know, tafakkur, you know, reflecting upon the signs that we see in the universe, the, Allah's wondrous creation. You know, just putting in an effort, putting in an effort to know what is real, to know what reality is. That, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, going, if I go back to Surah Al-Ankabut, Surah 29, Ayah 69, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ jahadu." You know, Allah uses the word, the verb jahadu that there, there's a struggle. It's not, it's not that, you know, someone's just kind of casually, you know, reading a little bit here, a little bit there. There's actually a thirst. There's a burning desire in them to know the truth. Otherwise, Allah would have never used the word jahadu. Jahadu really means that you're, you're, you're exhausting yourself. You're putting in, in an incredible amount of effort to, to arrive at this truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he sees that this person is seeking and, and asking and contemplating day and night, and you know, they're not they're not taking a vacation from this uh, from this quest for truth, that it's a it's a daily struggle. Allah says, Lanahdiannahum, this lamb is you know, it's and the, the, the shadda there is also for uh, for emphasis that surely, without a doubt, I will guide them towards my paths. So it's not that, you know, sometimes people say, you know, I, I, I'm searching for the truth, but they're, they're too laid back about it. They're not doing it with a sense of urgency that, you know, I only have a limited, limited amount of time on earth. My life is, is, has 
a very limited duration and they're seeking and investigating with a sense of urgency. No, if these are the types of people that Allah surely guides them. So it's it's really an, it's 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 shown in a number of ways, you know, supplicating to him, a asking Allah for his guidance, reading, researching, seeking out ulama, dedicating time to to research, pondering, contempl contemplation. These are all different ways in which uh, you know people you know seek uh, seek the truth. It's not just saying that I'm seeking the truth, you know. When you're seeking something, when you're thirsty for something, it's reflected in your behavior, in your daily routine, in your mannerism, in your schedule, right? Your schedule reflects your priorities in life. So if 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 you don't have if you don't dedicate any time to reading and researching and reflecting, then it's not a priority. Um, so my last question uh, is actually about the first topic you co uh, covered today, the Ayah 39. Uh, you talked about uh, uh, listening and being a good listener. Mm -hmm. um, so first question about this, um, is that, is, does that mean, uh, does the listening stand for it as a symbolic uh, word? Is that, does that mean taking lessons like, you know, seeing, reading, is that part of that listening? Um, or is that really, you know, just listening by, by the ear? Um, and um, the other question that I had about this was, um, um, I think that you have already answered that part with uh, your, your last statement, um, but what does that actually mean in our times to say that we, we need to listen? Um, what is the content that we have to listen to? Yeah, and what are, what are the priorities that you think we should we should have? Now, if, you know, going to your first question about attentive listening, because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in this ayah is essentially telling us, you know, why these individuals are rejecting the truth. It's because there's a spiritual there's a spiritual deafness. But again, this is just my understanding that you know I would argue that. You know, spiritual deafness is also connected to not using your physical ears, not actually listening attentively to the prophets and the messengers and to the, the truth when it is brought to you. So if someone is, is stubborn and not willing to listen objectively with their physical ears, this will consequently result in spiritual deafness. You know, it's, it's like the example that I gave a few sessions ago you know, when I spoke about the heart, you know, why is the heart sealed? Why does the heart lose its ability to function? It's because it's when something, when a muscle is not used, you know, the heart is like a spiritual muscle. When it's not used, it loses its function. When we don't use our ears to, to try to understand the truth, if we don't, if we're not objective and unbiased, this will ultimately happen this spiritual deafness will indeed occur so I, I would say that this this uh this loss of hearing is uh is definitely referring to spiritual deafness but i think that we shouldn't limit it to uh to that you know it's it's also this uh this unwillingness to even lend your ears and have an open mind and your second question was uh what was the second question um, what, um, you know, if you look at our time, uh, what uh, what does actually listening mean? What, where where do we have? What do we have to listen to? What are the contents and where are the priorities for us? So, what is the 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 con what, What's the content? What's the content that we should be listening to? So, basically, how can we apply this uh, this verse Perfect. in our daily lives? Attentive listening. I I would have to honestly, ref, you know, I would have to ponder over this uh, to give you a more complete answer. But just you know, off the top of my head, you know, one of the greatest impediments to attentive listening. Number one, we we have to we have to distinguish between what is what is worth listening to and what is something that's not worth our time. You know. Not all words, not everything is worth our attention, right? 
there, there, you know, there are a lot of speakers. There's a lot of information out there. I have to first be selective. You know, what is actually worth my time? Who should I actually lend my ears to? So we have to first identify, you know, who is who is worth listening to. We have to identify who are the true bearers of knowledge. Who are the ones who are qualified to speak? You know, because you should only attentively listen to someone who's speaking about an area that they understand. Otherwise, you know, you're wasting your time. You know, when you I, when you find that, you know, whether it's Quran, whether it's an alim, you know, whatever it may be, you know, removing distractions, removing the distractions. You know, if you go to the, the ayah that I mentioned, uh, where it's where it describes the Holy Prophet, you know, where the Prophet is kind of ridiculed as as being too consultative, and you know, as the ayah says, "Women whom al-ladina yudun al-nabi wa yaquluna huwa udun." I think generally, you know, so so basically, you know, to go back to your to your uh, to your question. You know, whenever anyone speaks to you, you know, because this was the habit of the Prophet, anyone who would speak to the Prophet Rasulullah would give them his undivided attention. And this was, you know, whether the Prophet is speaking to someone who is learned or someone who is ignorant. Because in reality, you can actually draw lessons from anyone. You can learn from the Jahil and you can also learn from the Alim. And you do that by being attentive. The Holy Prophet was attentive. He was a good listener, whether he was speaking to an educated person or an uneducated person. Because everyone, because you can learn lessons from anyone. So just developing this habit of deep listening, of attentive listening, will allow you to draw lessons from really anyone that you listen to. Because you know sometimes you don't really have a choice. Of who to listen to you know sometimes someone might start a conversation with you but you as a follower of rasulullah you have to develop this habit of listening attentively because you never know where you're going to receive hikmah where you're going to where you're going to hear something wise you know in my experience sometimes you speak to a child you speak to a child and you're able to learn the most profound lesson from a child i'll share with you a story a very brief story from Ayatollah Bahjat. Ayatollah Bahjat one day he he says that I was at home one day and there was a, there was someone who came to my home. And Ayatollah Bahjat says that I wasn't home at the time and this individual needed something from me. But they were told that I were I wasn't home. So there was a child in the alleyway that basically saw that this individual had come to my home and he was turned away. He says, you know, the sheikh is not available. So then this child said to this man who was coming to visit Sheikh Bahjat, you know, if you need something, why don't you ask your mom? <laughs> so when Ayatollah Bahjat heard this story, he was impressed by it. He said, if we had the same yaqeen and that this child has with respect to its mother, if we had this type of relationship with Allah, where if you have something, if you have a haja, ask Allah, what, what are you so confused about? In the same way that a child, when they need something, they say, why don't you go to your mother? So you find that lessons can be learned sometimes in the most unsuspected places but we were only able to do this if we kind of develop this this habit of being very attentive well inshallah I'll definitely I will give it more thought to see if there are perhaps you know, if there's another uh, another angle that I'm missing uh, in the eye I have one last um, how, do you, how do you know whether you're missing something or missing something when you're 
What if it seems like you're guided, but you're actually misguided? What are the signs to look out for? How do you know whether you're misguided or guided? Yeah. Inshallah, I'm actually going to speak about this uh, in our next session, about how to, you know, what are the signs of, uh, of because there are certain signs that we need to look for. Inshallah, I will, uh, I will cover that in our next session. So, you know, just like Netflix, they have, you know, cliffhangers. This will be our, our cliffhanger child. But give it some thought. You know, I want think about it for, for our next session and see what answers you come up with. And inshallah, I'll, I'll speak about this uh, topic as we go through the next uh, verses. But definitely, you know, there are alamat, there are signs. In the same way, you know, when you go to the doctor, how do you know that you're healthy? There are certain indicators of physical health. There are indicators of sickness. So we have ahadith, there are verses in the Qur'an that share with us the indicators of being guided and the indicators of being misguided. So there are alamat, there are signs. Thank you so much, Shay, for your time. And hope Thank you, you so much. May Allah bless you with your dua, inshallah. My wife always conveys her salam to all of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Please keep in your dawn, inshallah. I'll see you next week. See you, inshallah. See you, inshallah. Thank you very much.